Good to welcome everyone. Bruchem Abayim B'Shem Hashem. The Medrash tells us that Rabbanon Poschen Lapischa Lahai Parsha Samei Hacha. The rabbis, when they opened up Chumash Shemais, they started with a preface from a Posik in Hosea. The Posik in Hosea. You have to know, Shemais is a very jarring event. The family of the Viceroy Yosef, living in Goshen, was treated like royalty. The Jew, it was known, when Yaakov came down to Mitzrayim, the famine immediately stopped. They knew that Yosef HaTzadik saved the land. Everybody else's food spoiled, and his didn't. So he literally single-handedly saved the land, and he was a viceroy. It's not pshat that, you know, he had a short term. There were no term limits. He was viceroy in Mitzrayim from the age of 30 till the age of 110. 80 years. 80 years. So the Jewish people were from the elite, the aristocracy of Mitzrayim. The plunge from being royalty and aristocracy to being slaves that were wantonly murdered, 150 babies in the morning and 150 babies in the afternoon when power was stricken with leprosy. This change was so jarring. So the rabbi said that before learning Shemais, you have to have a preface. It's a posik in Hosea. Pasik says, Bashem Bogdu, you dealt treacherously with the Lord. Kibonim Zorim Yuladu. You had, you begat strange children. Ata Yaikhlaim Khaidesh Eschalkayam. Now a new one will come and eat up your portions. That's the Pasik in Aishaya. Explains. The Medrash. This is straight out of the Medrash. Kishemais Yosef a Feiru Brismila. When Yosef died, they annulled the Brismila. They annulled the circumcision. They stopped mulling themselves. You have to understand this before Matan Torah. There wasn't much of official mitzvahs to being a Jew. Jewish identity was circumcision. They said, let us be like the Egyptians. First case of official assimilation. Amru, this is Shmeis Rabbah, right in the beginning of Shmeis. Amru, Nia Kemitzriyim, we want to be like all the other Egyptians. Miyad, immediately. Hopach libam lisnoi amoi. Hashem changed their hearts to hate our people. To act deviously with his servants. Says the Medrash. That that's pshat. Hashem bugdu. You dealt treacherously with the Lord. You begot strange children. You stopped circumcising, circumcising your children. They're strange. After Yechleim Chodesh. And we'll eat your portions. So here, the Medrash is setting a rule that's built in into the world. And that is that if Jews start getting too close to the Goyim, and start becoming too Goyish, then the guy will repel. There will be actually a change in the guy's attitude to the Jew, and the guy will repel the Jew and push him away. It says, 
Kalal Yisrael is compared to oil, just like oil cannot mix with water, so too the Jew cannot mix with the nation. So as long as we fulfill Va'avdil eschem min ha'amim li'oisli, that we separate ourselves from the nations li'oisli, so then we're fine with the guy. As long as we live in Goshen and stay alone, then it's fine. But when vatimole ha'oretz oisam, when the world is, when the land filled with them, and we started going to the teatrios, the kakasios, the Medrash says, the theaters, the places of entertainment. You have to understand that in those days, it was a, a much more coarser entertainment. Even at the time of the Syrian Greeks, at the time of Yavanim, they engaged in their recreation without clothing. That's why we didn't want to circumcise ourselves. Because there was no clothing. It was noticeable. Now, today, nobody knows what's going on. But in those days, it was public promiscuity. Now, Yosef HaSadik foresaw all of this. And therefore, Yosef HaTzadik, when he gave the food, he made a deal. It says that when Mitzrayim finally ran out of food, they went to Paro. And Paro said, L'chu al Yosef. Go to Yosef. Now the question is, why did they go to Paro? Paro made a big deal that Yosef was the minister of agriculture. Right? For Yikru Lafan of Avreich. Avreich. They called him a ruler that they should bend their knees to him. Why did they run to Paro? So Rashi tells us they ran to Paro because they told Paro, you know, the Minister of Agriculture is making a very weird request. He's saying that if we want food, we have to circumcise ourselves. And they said, we're very worried because we heard somebody else try to pull that trick. It happened in the city of Shechem. They asked that people should circumcise themselves, and then they wiped them all out. So we're nervous. So Paro said to them, you're being foolish. You were told about the famine. You were told about the famine. You didn't put away food? They said, yeah, we did, but our food spoiled. He says, but Yosef's didn't. Right, the viceroy didn't. You think he has to employ trickery and deceit to wipe, wipe you out? If he wanted to wipe you out, a master like him doesn't need such deceit. Just do what he says. And the whole land circumcised themselves. So asks the Maral, asks the Taisus Arash, I don't understand. What was Yosef's reason to circumcise Goyim? We, we don't look to second. You know, we don't missionize. We don't missionize. If a guy comes to us and says, you know, we like this Jewish business, you know, we're interested. We don't say, oh, come, come to Shulish. We tell him, look, you do the seven eyed laws, be a righteous gentle. That Judaism is a very hard business. And we don't, we, we're certainly not looking to mass circumcise guy. So the Taisus Arash has an interesting answer. He says that Yosef was concerned that from the Benos Ketura made their way down to Egypt. And Yosef held that the Benos Ketura had to have circumcision. So that's why he circumcised the whole land because of the daughters of Ketura, because of the, because of the children of Ketura, Avram's other wife, Hagar. But that's not the popular answer. The popular answer was said by the Maral Miprag. The Maral, you know, we all know the Maral, the, the one that made the Golem, right? The Maral, Maral Miprag gave the famous answer. He says, Yosef saw, he had the foresight that there would be a time that the Bnei Yisrael will want to be like the Egyptians. And therefore, he said, if I get the Egyptians to also be circumcised, so then it won't be a problem. I'll take away the temptation. And as long as Yosef was in power, it worked. And this explains a very odd Targum 
in this week's parsha. It says, "Vayokam el chodesh al mitzrayim asher lo yada es Yosef." Says the targum, "The lo mikayim gezeras Yosef." He didn't fulfill the decree of Yosef. What's the targum talking about? Decree of Yosef. It's this decree. The Egyptians said, "We're not circumcising ourselves anymore. It's barbaric." And once the Egyptians stopped doing it, so we wanted to stop doing it too. We wanted to be like the guy. Now, the thrust of what I want to teach you here is the fact that as parents and grandparents, we have to always be aware of the challenges and look ahead, have foresight. For example, it tells us, Yaakov ish bo. Yaakov, a man and his house, they came. So what does it mean, a man and his house? So the Psik, the Zutrasa, the Medrash Agada, the Chizkuni, the Shari'ar, and they all say a house is a wife. Like it says, that the Koyen on Yom Kippur is Chichiper Ba'ado U Ba'ad Beiso, for himself and his wife. Or it says about Esther Amalka, that Mordechai Lekocha Loi Levas, and the Gemara says, Al Tikre Levas El Levayas. He took her as a wife. He couldn't say it outright because it wouldn't be uh, too nice to say that uh, the, the, the prime minister is married to the king's wife, so it had to say a daughter. But we know that she was his wife. A wife, is, a wife is the house. So when it says Yaakov ish uveisoi bo, it means that Yaakov saw that we were going down to a land that's stufezima, that's promiscuous, that's immoral, that's full of licentiousness, and therefore he married off all his children before going down. All his children. It says even... Chetzrein and Chomel, who are one and two years respectively, he married them off before coming down. In the crib, he made a marriage. In the crib. Because it wasn't safe. Now, many years later, in the early years of yeshivas like Tor Vadas, the Gedalim, when there would be B'nai Torah that would be studying to become doctors, they would insist that before they do their residency in the hospital, they get married. Why is that? You would think just the opposite. Residency is terrible for a Shana Rishayna. Residency, sometimes he has to be in the hospital 72 hours, and then after coming off a 72-hour shift, he sleeps for the next 24 hours. That doesn't bode well for a marriage but they understood the danger of the pretty blonde Catholic nurse. That's a, that's a big danger. Because not only was she blonde and pretty, but she was also kind. She was a nurse. That's a triple crown. Blonde, pretty, and kind. That's a triple crown. So therefore, they insisted that they get married first. That's the idea of Ishu Vesaybo. That's the idea of recognizing the danger. I'll give you another, more, even more contemporary example. A person decides to go to a bungalow county in the Catskills. And uh, you know, they're looking around and they find a nice bungalow and nice people, but they're not so. They're, they're about two notches below the religiosity. But I said, listen, we keep to ourselves. We're having all our children over. It's a big bungalow. It's, it's, you know, it's, they're nice people. We're not going to be like them. How short-sighted. Because they come for two years, and their 22-year-old notices a 19-year-old. Ah, she took it dresses, short skirts, and what could they do already? This chemistry. It's because they didn't have Chochmah. That's what the Torah teaches us. The Torah teaches us when you raise children 
and especially when you're in Golis, you have to have Chochmah. What's Chochmah? Ezel Chochmah, Roya Sanoilad. Somebody that looks ahead, somebody that has foresight. That's why it says, Chachmois Noshim Bonsa Boisa. The wisdom of a woman builds her home. The ability to look ahead. I find that people, when it comes to Chinuch, they're not looking ahead. I'm going to give you an example. Every week, and this is a good idea since I, I, I have no idea how many different places I'm reaching, so it's a good suggestion. People could copy it. I don't have a patent. I don't have a patent on, on ideas. By my other Subbanim, by my Matzi Shabbos learning program, Baruch Hashem, we have 100 parents and 100 children. Uh, I always speak five minutes. At the end of the program, tonight, because I had to come here, I left a little early, so I stopped the program in the middle to speak. But I speak five minutes, a practical lesson, whether I talk one day about the importance of saying please and thank you. On another day, I'll talk about the importance of behaving with the English teachers and that it's an important opportunity of Kiddush Hashem and a grave temptation of Chilul Hashem. I'll talk to them about something practical. I'll talk one week about the importance of knowing that if you embarrass someone in public, you could lose your olam haba. And therefore, I caution them that in the schoolyard, they should never embarrass a friend. They should never say, I don't want to pick you on my team. They should never say, you know, you have 12 left, 10 left fingers. Because that's embarrassing someone in public. So this week, I told the group, I said, I'm going to do something different this week. This week, after all, it's an Ova Yisu Bonim. This week, I'm not going to speak to the Bonim. I'm going to speak to the Ovois. I'm going to speak to the Tatas. I'm going to speak to the Zaydas, the Abbas and the Sabas. And I asked them a question. We just finished Chumash Bereshis. Chumash Bereshis is known as Sefer Ayosha. And it's called Sefer Ayosha because we study the lives of the Yeshurim, of the upright. Avram Yitzhak Yaakov, Sarah Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. And the Torah teaches us that we should look at how they behave and we should emulate them. Avram pitched his tent, his wife's tent first, so we learn you should honor your wife more than yourself. And Yitzhak was Metzache Kes Ishtoi, so we learn out that you have to make your wife happy. We, learn, we, should, we should learn from the Avais and the Imad. And then Hashem says, I'll teach you another way. I'm going to teach you, look at the way I behave. I clothe the naked, Adam and Chava. You should clothe the needy. Give shoes for families that don't have shoes. I remember my, my shver, my wife's father, Baron Ben Ramosha Gelptach, he, every year he would take a family of a lot of children. He, said, he would say, even back then, even back then, 40 years ago, he said, you know, if you have 10 children, to take them to the shoe store and buy shoes and sneakers, that's a huge amount of money. And he would pay for it. He would pay for the bill. And he would say, look what I'm doing. Every step they take in school, I have a sharing. All those kindle. So we learned that from Hashem, because Hashem clothed Adam and Chava, so we should do it. Hashem visited the sick, when he visited Avram, we should visit the sick. Hashem comforted the mourner when he comforted Yitzchak for, uh, uh, for the loss of Avram, so we should comfort the mourner because it says, we should walk in his way. So the cash is, I don't understand. Why does Hashem teach us in such an indirect way? Study Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, study Sar Rivka and Leah, study what I do. Tell us what to do. Clothe the naked, visit the sick. Honor your wife more than yourself. Why does the Torah have to teach us? Because Hashem is teaching us how to teach. The best way to teach is by example. 
best way to teach is by example. He's teaching us. You want to make a ben out of your child? Then make sure to open up a safer in the home. That's the way to make a ben -tayra. That's what Chavetz Chaim says. Why is v'limaritem oisom in the second parish of Kriyashma written defective without above? Because the best way to teach them is v'limaritem atem. This week, Ve'ela Shmoi stands for, as the Rabbeinu Ephraim says, it's quoted as a Balturim as well, even though it's not in our Balaturim. The Elish Shmoy stands for Vachayev Adam Lahashlum Aparsha Shnai Mikrevecha Targum. A child that falls asleep Friday night hearing his father lane Shnai Mikrevecha Targum will grow up to do Shnai Mikrevecha Targum because he'll remember the Tata Flektonazai. The Tata used to do that. By the way, it's a pella yaitz. It's a pella de capella yaitz. Pella yaitz is a sefer written by a very great man. It's written on the letters of the Aleph Beis. So on pay under Parshiyas, he says, we all know that the first gula in Shas for long life is to be Maver Sedra. It's in Brachas Tav Chesam and Aleph Chesam and Beis. Chayiv Adam Lahashlam Aparsha Shnai Mikra Vecha Targam. We'll have a length of days and years. So says the Peleyites, listen to this Peleyites. Says the Peleyites. He says, if somebody knows this teaching and doesn't bother to be Mavisedra, will be punished regardless. Why? He says like this. He says, if they don't believe in it, ah, no, you mean I'm going to open the Kumish, I'm going to live long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. You know? you know, if I want to live long, I'll exercise, I'll take multivitamins, I'll go for regular checkups. <laughs> so even if he doesn't believe in it, so it says whoever doesn't believe in the Divrei Chachamim, Nida in B'tzoya Roisachas, will be punished with boiling feces. He says, if he believes in it, but he says, look, he's like, hush, I don't have the time. I believe in it, but, you know, I'm busy. I think couples, I think dancha, you know, I'm, I'm busy. So then he says, then he's a ma'abadatz medas. He's committing suicide. Tyra says you can live longer, and he doesn't do it. That's a ma'abadatz medas. Scary thing. He says, if a person knows about it and doesn't bother, that's like committing suicide. You could live long. The Bnei Yisrael in the Magad Taluma says, this is an interesting thing. He says, why is there a, a promise for longevity? He says, because people are going to say, I don't have time. So Hashem says, you don't have time? I'll give you more time. I'll give you life. Rav Sternbach says it's the same reason why Hashem gives Laman Yerichin Yamecha for Kibbut Avaim? Because the sandwich generation says, I just don't have time. Yeah, I'm going to be saddled with this. I, I'm not going to live. Hashem says, Don't worry. Take care of your parents. Take care of your children. I'll give you plenty of time. I'll give you a long life. And I wanted to add that's why it says, Marichin Yamavushnaisev. Because somebody will say, Okay, you give me a long life, but right now I don't have time. Hashem says, No, I'll give you longer days. I'll give you longer days. Right now, I'll give you more time. And if you ask me how that's possible, I remember growing up with Ramosha Feinstein. Ramosha Feinstein, on a regular day, would have two brisson in the morning, sometimes two levias during the day, and almost every night, four chasanas. They used to stagger the chasanas that the chuppah would start when he would arrive. The band would start playing. As soon as he came in the building. And I used to think to myself, what a, sh what a shame. Here's the Bali Gris Moshe. He's paskening about genetic testing, about heart transplants, about electric eye elevators. Let somebody else do all these things so he could sit and paskin for the world. But he didn't think this way. You know why? Because there's a Gemara in the Dorim. The Gemara says, Mimidbar Matana. Misha Mesim Atzmai Kamidbar, if you free yourself to everyone like a midbar, Torah is giving to you as a gift. And what I, what I think that means is 
is that Ramayisha was able to arrive at his brilliancies with lightning speed that otherwise would have taken him four hours to figure out. But because he made his time available to others, Hashem gave it to him as a gift. And that's the way it is with us too. We make time for Mavisedra. Hashem says, don't worry, I'll give you more time. Now, I don't want the women to shut down when I start speaking about Mavisedra because they're a big part in it also. A wife should tell her husband, you know, if you want to be Mavisedra now, I'll wait up for you. If you want to be Mavisedra, we'll start our Sunday afterwards. We have, a, we have a challenge that, Baruch Hashem, we have a lot of young, um, empty nesters. The children are already married. A wife is home alone, and her husband wants to go out on a Friday night to a shear. She says, look, I don't want to be left alone the whole night. You know, I, you have to know that when a husband goes out to learn, a husband has to be judicious also. He has to give time for his wife. But when a husband goes out to learn, a woman gets full schar. The Gemara says, Noshim Bameh Zachyon. How do women merit? That's a very troubling Gemara. A woman says, what do you mean, how do I merit? What, am I chopped liver? What do you mean, I make the Shabbos? You know, that's not a merit? I raise the children, it's not a merit? You have to ask a Shaila, Noshim Bameh Zachyon? What kind of a Shaila is that? I mean, if I was a woman, I'd be very offended. What am I? Every time I don't speak Lashonara on the phone, I'm not getting Zechusim? Every time I keep a kosher kitchen, I'm not getting Zechusim? What do you mean, Noshim Bamezachion? It's a big cash. One of the most beautiful answers to this question that I've ever seen is the Gemara asks, how do we defeat the Yetzirah? So it says, Barasi. Yetzirah, Barasi Torah Tavlin Law. I created the Yetzirah, I created Torah as its antidote. And here the woman says, where's my antidote? If I don't have the Dafayomi, so where's my antidote against the Yetzirah? And the answer is when she raises her children to learn Torah and she waits for her husband. It's a key Gemara. Not tells her husband. If a wife tells her husband anything, he usually does the opposite. No husband likes to be told to do. <laughs> but you wait for him. You say, listen, you want to be Mavisedra? Go for it. I know I want to go to sleep, but I'll wait up for you to be Mavisedra. That's her power against the Yetzirah. But I got myself sidetracked. I don't want to get sidetracked from the Iker message we're talking about raising our children to look ahead at challenges. And I told you, I told the parents, we learn out that the reason why the Rabbi Shalom teaches us in a secondhand manner, in an indirect way, by studying the Avais and the Imais, by studying his behavior, Halak the Bedrachavis, he's teaching us the best way to teach our children. The best way to teach our children is by example, and therefore, Foolish to the extreme is a father that walks out of the Rav's drasha. Right before the Rav gets up to speak, he dashes out. He's making kiddush. His children see that. His children see that. And then they grow up to run out of the Rav's drasha. Or a father that talks during davening. What's he doing to his children? We know talking during davening, the Shulchan Aruch says, is a chait and a vaynoi gadol minasai. It's sin is too heavy to bear. But a parent has to know that if he's going to talk during davening, that's going to become normal to his children. And anybody that later tells him that you shouldn't talk, he won't even listen. You know, I, I have it because I have, I have in my shul already three generations. I'm around for 33 years, Pastor Sajab, Liyayin Hara, many years more. And, and I know I go over to someone and I start talking to him about talking in shul. He changes the subject in front of my face. Now you would think the Rav is talking to you, be embarrassed, be meek, be shamefaced. 
tell me he's strong. He changes the subject like he's offended. Why? Because his tata did it. I'm telling him to do not like the tata. The tata held that it was a shtick, this stalking business. It becomes a shita. You know, I knew a guy, well meaning guy. But when when the Chazan said over Shemayn Eser and got to Val Kulam, he used to say Val Kilam. He thought it was cute. So whenever the Chazan said Val Kulam, he would say Val Kilam. <laughs> so, so I went over to him one day and I said, what do you want? You're eniklich to say the Zedeflek Zogin Val Kilam? That's the legacy you want to leave your children and grandchildren? that the Tata used to say, I'll kill him? People don't realize. Everything that we do, we're teaching by example. It's a huge responsibility. But it also, why don't people focus on this? Because they don't look ahead. You know, at my Seder table, when I get up in the Haggadah, to the, where it says, Malame Shahoyu Bene Yisrael Mitsuyonim Sham. It teaches us that the Bene Yisrael were distinguished there. And it says that they didn't change their Jewish clothing. So at my Seder table, I tell my children that even as slaves, mercilessly treated, we didn't lose our sense of dignity and modesty. So one time, my daughter, Devorah, asked me, Tati, you say this every year. Do we give you any shred of a reason to tell us this? I mean, they're all dressed perfectly modestly. So they wonder, why do you say it, Tati? So you don't understand. You, I'm not worried about at all. But I'm saying it. You're going to say it by your Seder table to your children, and they will say it to their children, because that's the Messiah that I'm handing down. And do I know what my generations are going to look like? I'll give you an example, a personal example. Many of you might have read my Father's brother, my uncle, the last brother, passed away on Hanukkah. It was in all the papers. It was, uh, there was a full-blown picture of him in the Mishpacha. My uncle was Moshe Weiss. Uh, he passed away at 91, and uh, he left a magnificent legacy. His, all seven of his sons, dads, my uncle Moshe and Aunt Ida Itibadu L'chaim, had seven sons. Every single one of them is a Bucky Bashas and is a Rav or a Rosh Kailan. And uh, he was Mechutin Sir Friedrich Kakos Megareba. It's worthwhile mentioning one of the stories, which is so after the war, my uncle Moshe, who survived Auschwitz, Cherbinka, Bergen Belsen, and Dachau. After the war, he hooked up, actually he hooked up with the Klozen Megarebbe in Auschwitz. What happened was, is he was in the barrack next to the Klozen Megarebbe, and the Klozen he wanted to be so much together with the Klozen Megarebbe. So there was somebody in his barrack by the name of Handler, and his son was in the Klozen Megarebbe's barrack. So he figured that the son would probably want to be with the father to help the father. So he went to the son, he says, let's switch barracks. So he says, yeah, but if we get caught, we die. It's not like, you know, dormitory. So he says, no, no problem. From now on till the end of the war, you're Moshe Weiss and I'm Shia Handler. They switched identities. He says, there's no identity cards here. From now on to the end of the war, I'm, I'm Shia Handler, you're Moshe Weiss. So they did that, and they switched. So he was together, he came to Rosen uh, Rebbe, he told him he switched barracks. So the Kozum Rebbe said, well, you think I'm going to protect you, you know, with Anivas? He said, no, Rebbe, I want to learn with you. He says, here in the camps? He said, yeah. So, okay, they learned throughout the whole camps. So after the war, 
the Kalazim Rebbe's mission right after the war was to bury the Kedosh. And the Germans gave him a group of Germans to help, but they couldn't touch the, the, the bodies, the Kedosh, because there was a huge typhus risk. And the Rebbe would get, eventually get typhus. I think I once mentioned that it's brought down in the Kisvei Tzans that what did the Rebbe do in the three months that he was in the hospital in Germany? He was Mavis Sedra for all those months that he was in Auschwitz that he couldn't be Mavis Sedra. That's what he did while he, was at, while he had the typhus. So Uncle Moshe said that they would drive a truck, it would be full of bodies, and they would schlep the bodies in and clean up the bodies and do tires. And finally, Uncle Moshe, if this is after the concentration camp, he says, Rabbi, I can't do it anymore. So the Rebbe says to Moshe, Bet Epis, ask for something. So Uncle Moshe said he saw he was given a golden opportunity. So he said to him, Rebbe, I want that all my descendants, he had just got married to my aunt in Fernwald, Fernwald in the DP camp. He says, I want a bracha that all my Yotzei Chalitzein should know every Taisvus and Shas. That was his request. How many people would ask such a request? <laughs> every one of his children knows every Taisvus and Shas. I can tell you that. From the youngest, from who I call Duddy, nobody calls him Duddy. He's Rosh Kailal in Stamford in, in London, Stamford Hill. To the oldest, Rabbi Yaman, who's the Avbezdin in Montreal, they all know every Taisvus and Shas. But, and here's a but, there was a big error in that article. And listen, they wrote it fast. Uh, there was a big error. They said that my uncle Moshe was the only survivor from his family. Thank God that's not true, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Uh, although, although on the first day of Shavuos, in the second sailor should transport, uh, my father and he lost father, mother, four brothers, and one sister on one day. But my uncle Moshe survived, my father, Zichron Levracha, survived, and another uncle survived, another brother survived, who passed away recently as well in Schenectady. Now, my grandfather, who of course I never met, he was gassed in Auschwitz, Hashem Yinkam Damai, Rav Meir Weiss, my grandfather was a, a Yid, a Baki Bishas. Would he ever imagine? that his son Hilu, who survived the war, would raise a family in Schenectady, not from because of the ravages of war, we can't judge him, and one of their sons would be a male ballerina. Would he ever in a million years think of such a thing? That's the way we have to be mechanach. We have to be mechanach our children and give them as much yesidas for the future. Do we know which child might get married and move to Florida because their son is learning by Rabbi Zweig in, in Florida, the son-in-law, and move to Florida, and in the place where they're learning in Florida, they only have a mixed cheder, which, by the way, is normal till this day. The Jewish community in Scranton, until fourth or fifth grade, is mixed. That's all they have. They're from a community in Scranton, but that's all they have. And all of a sudden, they're going to have to learn how to deal with, your, with girls. That's being mechanic with an eye to the future. That's chachmais noshim bonsa boisa. We have to realize that at any moment, we are a role model. I, I remember vividly, many years ago, our three oldest were little children, and I remember how uh, the, these three are all married with many children of their own. But I remember that my wife and I gave them a present, a very expensive dish set. It was a very expensive set. I remember in those days, in those days, I remember, it was over $50. And it came with a tablecloth, and it came 
with uh, plates and, and goblets and a decanter. It came with everything. It was really sophisticated. Now, one day when I went to shul on a Friday night, my wife told me she watched mesmerized as they set a Seder table. And one person was Tati, and one was Mommy, and one was the kids. And my wife said she watched from a distance as they mimicked us to perfection. <laughs> they gave, they, one gave to the other the special look I give my wife when I don't like something, what they're doing. They knew it all. And it's so instructive, children are mamish a sponge. And they hop. They hop when they see Daddy, Tati, Abba come home, and, and he's reading the daily news, but he insists that they learn. They, they see the hypocrisy. They see it. We have to realize, and we really have to realize, that they see if we get angry at mommy and if we're not talking nicely. And then when we tell them that that's not the way to talk, they, they, it, it, it doesn't compute. Very, this is a very dangerous thing. I mean, I, I could give you, I was once in a closed door meeting, a, a very hush of a therapist from Chicago spoke there. It was actually about our good convention, our good Rabbanim. He addressed us, and he said there was a boy that was totally disrespectful to his parents, totally disrespectful to the rebellion. They couldn't understand what was eating at the kid. The boy opened up to him. He says, you know, my father always preaches everything goody-goody. He says, you know, Friday night, I started having a suspicion right after the meal, my father went into the bedroom. Now, many people do that. They collapse after a heavy meal. But he says, I started having suspicions that my father went in and was watching television. So he said, one day when we were going to shul, I ran into the bedroom. Right before I told my father, I have to run upstairs. I ran into the bedroom, and I moved the remote control to a different place. And then I went to shul, and after my father came out Friday night, I snuck in the bedroom, and I saw the remote control was back in a different place. And I found out my father was watching television Friday night. After that, all my respect for him went out the window. Now, of course, that's a, an extreme example, but, you know, take Take the parent who preaches charity and kindness and tells his child when there's the third doorbell on a Sunday morning, he says, go and answer them and tell them your parents aren't home. Now, what kind of a chinuch is that? You know, they say always a joke, but it's not funny, but it is funny. They say a joke that, you know, here's a father that's always telling his children, you got to be honest, you got to have integrity. You look at these politicians and see how they cheat and how dishonest they are. We're different. We're, we're people of, of MS, Tita and MS Lyakov. He sends them off to camp, and he tells them, you know, it's a shud de gelt. Those are the days of pay phones. The shud de gelt that you should just call a collect call and say it's a collect call from Shindu. And we won't, Shindu means you, I'm here already. And we won't accept, well, no. Right, so the, as the story goes, he calls up, collect, do, collect call from Shindu, and the operator was a Yiddish, she said, Taka, you know, <laughs> you know. You know, as I said, it's amusing, but we have to be very careful not to send mixed messages to our children. We're living in a time when what swirls around us is extremely dangerous. A parent 
that allows their child to be alone in the home without, with unrestricted internet is not a smart parent. Like Rabbi Zechariah Wallerstein said to me, so a parent came and said, my child who was caught with pornography. So what do you mean your child was caught? Your child's a healthy, curious child. You're going to leave him alone with a computer. What do you think he's going to do? What do you think? It, if your child is using a computer and he's locking his door, red alert! Red alert! I mean, if he, he was in the room with a girl and he locked the door, what would you do? Is in with the computer? Computer is stein vamay. Computer is stein vamay. A child, has, why do you think he's locking the door? To have yechidus with his computer? Why, why do you think he's locking the door? He's locking the door because he doesn't want you to catch him looking at uh, all kinds of nakedness. That's, that's a fact. And that's not the child's fault. Child's a healthy, normal, curious child. It's your fault. You're not being a chacham. A parent has to be aware of the dangers. Yosef Atzadik taught us this when he tried to take the temptation away. There are different ways to do it. The Hele Gesat Rebbe felt that by dressing the Hasidim different, by preserving the Yiddish, do you know that Rav Miller left the Tzavo, an ethical uh, will to his descendants? One of the major provisions, I saw it, one of the major provisions in his ethical will was is that his direct descendant should speak Yiddish in the home. Because you have to realize that if you speak Yiddish in the home, they're not tempted. They're comfortable with Yiddish. They're not tempted to watch the movies. They're not tempted to read the novels. It's not a Yiddish. It takes away a lot of the temptation of the hostile environment that we're living in. Now, that's, it's not possible for everyone. But to close your eyes and say, listen, what will be will be, that's not a Yiddish atata and a mama. A Yiddish atata and a mama has to be concerned. When I send my child to a school, am I doing it because it's geographically convenient? Am I doing it because it's financially sensible? Or I'm doing it because the peers of my children will be the best influence on them, the best influence upon them. The peers of our children make our children. There's nothing like a friend to, to shape the wants and dislikes of a child. And that's why it's so important that the friends, that the peers should be quality should be Taira, should be Ruach Yisrael Saba, friends, neighbors. That's why when in Pirkei Avis, when we're looking for the four best things, together with Leiv Taiv and Ayin Taiv is Shochen Taiv and Chavar Taiv. Isn't that amazing? I mean, Leiv Taiv, that's everything. Ayin Taiv, that's everything. But a Chavar Taiv and a Shochen Taiv is right up there. A good neighbor, a good friend, it's our responsibilities to know who our children are hanging out with. Unfortunately, people wake up when it's too late. It's too late. If you're going to talk at the table disparagingly about the school principal, now it could be that the school principal is not such a good principal. We don't, we don't hit home runs all the time. It could be the school principal is old school. He's not up with the times. You know, we have changing times. Just look around you at all these cameras here. It's uh, cameras, digital recorders, uh, uh, streaming live. It, it's, you know that today's rebellion have to be performers? It's not enough to be a Rebbe and know the stuff. You have to be almost an entertainer. You know, you see sometimes pictures of speakers coming, 
and they look almost like entertainers. They have their feet up, and they look, they look like they're coming to entertain, you know? <laughs> because people have such short attention spans that they need to be entertained. They have such short, and that's the way the children are, especially those that their minds have been vegetated and atrophied by television and videos and computers. It's very hard. I remember I once told Rabbi Respler, who used to be the Manal of Torah Semes, I said to him, you know, really, you should have, if you want to have a 45-minute class, you should have 45 rebellion and pull out each Rebbe after a minute. So he looked at me strangely, and I told him, you know, there's an unwritten law amongst the Television Directors Guild that you cannot have one scene frozen for more than one minute unless there's some sex or violence. Otherwise, you got to change the scene. So the children are used to getting things in minutes, so you got to have a Rebbe, pull them out after a minute, put in another Rebbe, pull them out after a minute. It's, it's, it, that would be very expensive to do that. <laughs> It'd be very expensive to do that. And that's why my son is, uh, my oldest son, Nehemia, is the fourth grade Rebbe in Darche, in Farakaway, one of the fourth grade Rebbe's. And I see him prepare, and it's frightening. I mean, it's, I, I have all the covered for him in the world, but I see that he has to bring in props, and he has to bring in pi pictures, and he has to... He has to keep them, he, he, he has to keep them every minute with rapt attention because it's, a, it's, a, new, it's a, a new generation. So let's say that the principal, he's not, let's say, with it. So the parents are speaking by the Shabbos table and say, you know, they got to get rid of this principal. And they're saying this in front of the children. Now, right now, the authority for their children is this principle. What are the parents thinking? Are they insane? Are they insane? You know, those families that at the Shabbos table disparage the rebbeim, the teachers, the rabbi, they don't realize that that boomerangs against them. Because the ultimate authority in the children's life is them. And one day, if these children are raised without respect to authority, they're going to say, you know something? I've listened to you enough. I've had it. They'll say that to their own parents. I know. Again, I've seen it. I've had a parent who came crying to me that their child, their daughter, is dating a credit card thief. And she's mamish. Uh, head over heels, and she doesn't want to listen to reason. Could I talk to her? I want to take a bat and hit him over the head. Now you ask me, after, after 15 years, making the Rabbunas as someone you don't listen to and don't have respect for, now you're asking me, now you're coming to me? Of course, I didn't tell them that, but I'm telling it to you. Know that when you teach respect for others to your children, you are really teaching them to respect you. I always tell people, I always tell people, a small thing in shul is a great accomplishment. Take your little children to the rabbi to say good Shabbos. You have no idea what a gift you're giving to them. If you do that every Shabbos, by the time they're bar mitzvah, they've gone to the Rav thousands of times. There's a very good chance that when they grow up, they'll go and ask a Shiloh to a Rav. Because you've trained them to go to the Rav. And I see it. I see those children that their parents did that. After they get an aliyah, they walk up to the front and give me Yashikaya. Because their parents trained them to do that. That's, that's looking ahead. You know, the Svardim are way ahead of us on this. The Svardim, I remember, you know, now in Staten Island, 
we're having a renaissance in Staten Island. 60 Hasidic families already moved into Staten Island, and the numbers are growing. So I told my Kehillah that I remember when the Sfardim first came to Flatbush. I gave a shir in the home of Julie Miss, uh, Rabbi Usher and Julie Benno for many years on Quentin Avenue. I gave a shir to Sfardi women. Uh, I remember I came before, before Pesach. I was going to give a, a shir. A, the whole shir was on Chasal Siddur Pesach. And they're looking at me. They don't say Chasal Siddur Pesach. They had no idea what I was talking about. It was, different, it was a different culture, right? So I remember Rabbi Vigdor Miller telling people, do you realize the opportunity we have? He says, all of the traditions of Istanbul, of Baghdad, which we've never been influenced by, now we're going to see the kavod to the chacham. Now we're going to see how they say a psukit a zimre, a psukit a zimre that we don't even say on a Yom Kippur. It's an opportunity, an opportunity to learn. So I'm teaching you one lesson. You look at that they impart to the children the cover to a chacham. We have to be careful. Now, it's not easy to do this because you see, we don't like to be criticized. And many times the rabbi criticizes. The rabbi says, you know, you're not coming to davening in the morning. You're not, you're not regular by minion. I don't see you by shiurim. I don't like the way you spoke to your wife. The rabbi tells the woman, you know, you never asked me any shilas. I don't understand how that's possible. We don't like to be criticized. So it's the, the natural thing is, is that to dodge the criticism, we deflect it by saying, the rabbi is not so, I, I, I heard that speech before, you know. We judge the judges instead of listening. It's normal deflection. But we have to be careful because our children are listening. Our children are registering. And if they, they see that we're by a bar mitzvah and when somebody gets up to speak, they say, I'm out of here. We dash out dash out, then they grow up. And you know something else? I've heard it from more than one person. I never wanted to be in a shul with a rabbi because I saw how much my parents suffered with the rabbi. I, I saw my father, he couldn't stand it. So what I needed for, I'll go to a shul without a rabbi. What a tragedy. So now, he's married, he's married. And he tells his wife, listen, you're off, you just had a baby. You're off for six weeks. You take care of the child in the night. I, 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 I got to go to work tomorrow. So don't wake me up. Poor woman, she's a kimpeter. She could hardly get out of bed. She wants him to at least bring her the baby. He says, don't wake me up. I got to get my sleep. What does she do? She has a rabbi. She call up the rabbi or the rabbi's wife. And the rabbi will have a talk to him. And the rabbi will tell him, listen, if you need help, I'll come over and help you. And he'll get the message very quickly. There's no rabbi. What, what's she going to do? I know I have this sometimes. Somebody's a contractor, a yeshiva guy. He's a contractor. He did 80% of the job, and he took a new job. He doesn't finish 20%. So they come to me, and uh, my balabatman, they come to me and say, well, what do we do with this guy? He, it's not, nothing, is, nothing is plugged in. Nothing is working. He didn't finish the job. He says, yeah, yeah, I'll get to it. He took another job. He needs more money. He took another job. So I said, well, who's his rav? He doesn't have a rav. Where does he daven? Where the kugel is best. <laughs> right? So who's his rosh Shiva? Oh, he says, yeah, he has a lot of respect for his rosh Shiva. Who's his rosh Shiva? Rav Schneer Cutler. So where am I going to go, to the cemetery? <laughs> this is a big problem. Big problem. I tell people their daughters are dating somebody. Find out if the boy has a rav, a rebbe. It's huge. It's significant. But where does this come from that people don't want a rav? It comes when parents walk out of a drasha when they speak disparagingly about a rav. And the, the child says, 
Listen, he heard it all. That his father is, his, you know, his teacher, his mentor. His father suffered so much with the rabbi. So get me out of here. What do I need it for? In general, we should realize the Chayiv Kadesh that we have. You know, Rav Tversky said, he said, short thing, but he said, he says, there's certain ultra-Orthodox couples that don't show physical warmth with their ch in front of their children. He says, I have no problem with that, as long as they don't fight in front of their children. But if they do one without the other, what message are they sending to their children? How we behave with our spouse in front of the children. We are paving the way if they see us respectful to one another, courteous, sensitive, offering to one another, smiling at one another, apologizing to one another. We're mamish paving the way for our children. That's what we're doing. Let me tell you that as parents, we're given a treasures. And through the gift of genetics, we're given the way to raise them. Because with genetics, our children are like us. So therefore, we can understand what makes them tick. And as long as we're alive, as long as we're alive, right? Because it says uh, that shalavicha v'yagetcha zekeinecha v'yomrulach. And it's Sam Seifer says, for Hashem Hashem will give you extra years because of your descendants. Because if you show that you want to spend time with your great grandchildren, with our great grandchildren, so Hashem says, Oh, if you want to pass the Messiah to your great grandchildren, I gotta give you the opportunity. Says the Sam Seifer, that's Pshat Vaisircha Hashem Befree Vitnacha. So we should never relinquish this privilege and this extra lease at life to make an imprint on as many generations as we can. As always, I'd like to thank Chazak for making this possible. Thank you very much for coming and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>